I'm Tony Farrell and uh, I used to work for South Yorkshire Police in, up until 2010, July, uh, as the Principal Intelligence Analyst and uh, I suppose I'm uh, infamous now for being dismissed from the police uh, and I'm in a reasonably high profile employment tribunal case with them uh, for the dismissal which I claim is unfair. Okay, and, and why were you dismissed? Well, I held a belief that they said it was incompatible, um, but there's a lot more to it than that. Basically, um, I made a stance at work regarding an uh, assignment I was doing. The assignment concerned a strategic threat, and the threat um, partic in particular concerned the domain of counter-terrorism. And what caused me a problem was that um, I was expecting to go along with a government narrative which said that the threat was coming from Islamic terrorism. And um, I made a stance against that because without seeing proofs I wasn't prepared to say that when I thought there was a more sinister threat around and that was coming from, sadly, uh, internal tyranny. And I say that on the basis of uh, issues like 9-11 and the London bombings on July the 7th, 2005. Um, and our wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. So I saw the threat as something quite different from what the government narrative wanted me to say was the main threat and what my employers, so the Office of Police, senior managers wanted me to say. And can you give us some examples how you came to those conclusions? Yes, um, it was funny really because in the course of having this assignment to do which is a strategic threat, and what's more, it was a little bit uh, beyond, uh, different from a strategic threat in as much as it was a simplified model of threat. I um, simply uh, had not anticipated a problem. And um, I dropped on in the week before the assignment was due, which was on the 8th of July 2010. I came across um, information on the internet all of a sudden, uh, quite by accident, at home. Um, which alerted me to the possibility that 9-11 was an inside job. Now that came from uh, sources such as Alex Jones, uh, Jesse Ventura at first. That was, that, that was what I dropped on in the first instance. And that prompted me to look at other things that were available readily on the internet, which included the film uh, Loose Change and 9-11 Ripple Effect. And having sat through and watched those, I was prompted to try and read a little bit more about it. And it wasn't <laughs> difficult to come to a conclusion almost immediately that something was radically wrong with the government's narrative, the US government's narrative on 9-11. And um, I was familiar with uh, issues such as the New World Order and um, what was underpinning that. So I, I did see 9-11 immediately. Um, I was alerted to the possibility. I saw that as a, an example of the New World Order at work and I was horrified and shocked. Uh, and the problem I had with that was it immediately put me in a difficult position because I, I knew in a week's time I was expected to be in front of a board at South Yorkshire Police giving a presentation which was producing the strategic threat assessment matrix where top of the table in the time of threat stakes would be the threat coming from Islamic terrorism. And I was think my way of thinking was that I didn't believe, I no longer believed that this was 19 Muslim suicidal maniacs that crashed into that building. Um, I believed it was something different and uh, an inside job um, deliberately perpetrated to blame the Muslims in order to justify a foreign, an aggressive foreign policy agenda in the Middle East, which was you know the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq that were to follow close on the hand of this. So I saw it as something sinister and of course without Without proofs, I wasn't prepared to lie. And this was just on the basis of 9-11 alone. Um, so I was thrown into a state of shock, and I was at work. The, after it dawned on me, I was at work the next day, and I was struggling with the assignment then, in terms of how do we cope with this? If I stick my head above the parapet, I'm in trouble. Uh, and I actually went and spoke to a minister at lunchtime and said, I've got a crisis of conscience. And he said, have you, you know, shocked by what I told him about 9-11? Bear in mind this was open source information, so I wasn't breaching official secrets act. But I simply uh, got the shock 
when he turned around and said, have you thought about the London bombings? And I was rocked back in my seat and I'm a bit embarrassed because I hadn't actually considered the London bombings by any stretch of the imagination. But when I got home that evening, I, I, I um, resolved to check out the London bombings and with the expectation of reassuring myself that at least it wasn't the, the case in the United Kingdom. Because uh, I couldn't at this stage believe that our government would you know, be capable of um, doing such a thing as a, you know, fabricating a story um, on the London bombings. But when I looked at it at home, I was immediately worried because films like uh, Mind the Gap, Ludicrous Diversion, that were a, a seven seven ripple effect, were readily available on the internet. I watched as many um, videos that I could and then read the official account. And th that immediately alerted me. And on the back of 9-11, um, I felt as though I wasn't now able to say that the threat was coming from Islamic terrorism and the time was approaching when the assignment was due so I went in to the police my, my director of intelligence on the 6th of July with a bit of a red alert saying look the internet is exposing 9-11 uh, um, and people are waking up to it I says, and it's also exposing the London bombings and they said that that in itself is a problem for community cohesion as people start to wake up there will be massive widespread distrust in the government and of course I, I, I was a bit reluctant to go full frontal with this but I did say and by the way I don't believe 9-11 anymore and I don't believe the London bombings was as a government narrative anymore and you're expecting me to say that the threat was from Islamic terrorism in a day's time would you please show me some proof? Now, just that alone, alerted my director of intelligence to that fact. My director of intelligence then said, Tony, you and I will never get them to tell the truth. So he didn't say I was wrong. He just, and he says, we're just a government foot soldiers. So basically, they were asking me to skirt around the notion of it being an inside job and carry on as normal and say that the threat was coming from Islamic terrorism. They also asked me at that point in time, just by giving them that alert, to go to occupational health and get yourself checked out. Admittedly, it was a bit of a, it, this was this took a, this was a courageous thing to do for me to stick my head above the parapet, knowing that it could land me in big trouble. I wasn't naive, but I didn't expect them to sort of immediately push me towards occupational health. That in itself was menacing. Um, and at this stage, on the 6th of July, they, had still, they were still hoping to persuade me to go along with them with what I now consider to be a lie and ignore and turn a blind eye to my own findings, albeit these findings were outside of work. And so that was the situation, and they wrapped me up on co in cotton socks on the 7th of July, and looked at my assignments to make sure I was in a position to deliver at the board meeting the next day. And I was, because I'd done all the scoring of these matrices. Um, it, at the time, I'd scored it up in the belief that the threat was indeed coming from Islamic terrorism because I believed the government rhetoric. So I'd, I'd accepted that initially as the truth, and nothing but the truth. Um, and nothing that was coming to me by my special branch analysts that would give me science reports ever differed, ever differed from the government narrative. So I suddenly saw this as a challenge for me, do, do I perpetuate the lie and just accept the government narrative and hand out a strategic threat assessment matrix, um, knowing what I know? And I, I come to the conclusion my conscience wouldn't allow me to do this. So although they thought I was going to do it, I was going to go along with it on the 7th, by the time I got home on the 7th of July 2010, exactly five years to the day of the London bombings, I resolved that, that my time had come to make a stance the next morning. So my tactic was to get in work extra early. So I got into work at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I looked at all my assignments that had all been prepared to delivery for the board meeting that afternoon. And in particular the front sheet of the strategic threat assessment matrix. And I did sort of scored it all up uh, in accordance with what I considered to be the threat and harm and the risk. And, instead, and I looked at it and said, this is all rubbish in the context of 9-11, 7-7 being inside jobs. 
So basically I bastardised the whole front sheet with the scoring system and put in some ludicrous looking scores um, that focused in on the counter-terrorism domain and focused in particular on 9-11 and 7-7. Now the strategic threat assessment matrix fed the control strategy and it was also delivering a control strategy that day or a proposal for the control strategy which again had a front sheet and that covered up to about um, 16 or so domains and themes that the force would focus on for the year. And behind these themes would be aims and objectives and rationale why it was a priority. And instead of actually showing them that front street that I'd prepared, again I'd bastardised that and crossed that. And this would have things like how we'd tackle burglary dwelling, how we'd tackle public protection issues such as child abuse, how we'd tackle high volume crime as well as counter-terrorism. And I just completely crossed out everything as irrelevant other than the counter-terrorism domain where I put in a little note, in, well in large font size, 9-11 truth, 7-7 truth. And when, I, when the boss comes in at 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, I knocked on his door and said, do you want to have a quick look at the control strategy for the day and the strategic test assessment matrix? Now the boss hadn't seen my preparation for this. It was another manager who'd checked me out the previous day. Uh, and I thrust it in front of his nose. And he got the shock of his life, basically, when he saw my ludicrous-looking scoring sheet for the, the threat assessment and my proposal for the force control strategy that afternoon. And he, he immediately cottoned on that what I was doing was making a stance and he wasn't going to change my mind. And although he says, look, he, again, he said, you and I will never get them to change and we're just a government foot soldiers. But he realised that I was making a stance and that this now was going to derail the board meeting that afternoon. And by this time, some of the fear had gone and um, I decided, and he, see, he decided to send me home and ask me to produce a report to explain the situation, in particular explain my stance. What he didn't want, and he made clear, was he didn't want my analysis as to why I thought 9-11 and 7-7 were an inside job. He just wanted me to explain why I felt compelled to do what I did and not deliver at the Intelligence Strategy Management Board, which was a board meeting. So off I went home um, and prepared a report over the weekend and, and, and took the report in. Um, now, I call, it entitled the report A Rich Picture um, of an Ignoble Lie, and the rich picture referred to the government's counter-terrorism strategy. And rich picture involved collecting information, intelligence, primarily targeting on the Muslim community as a result of the government's narrative on the terror threat, which was from Islamic extremism. And I saw that now as a putrid strategy already because it was based on what? The falsehood behind the narrative of the London bombings and 9 11. And so I saw this now as demonising the Muslim communities. And South Yorkshire Police has a Muslim community, both in Rotherham and Sheffield. Um, and therefore I felt it was my duty and my conscience wouldn't allow me to do anything else other than to make that stance. And, and I didn't pull any punches in this report. I said, I'm a principal intelligence analyst, not a spin doctor. Uh, I'm not your Alistair Campbell. Um, a principal analyst is there to objectively analyse. You asked me to do analysis and my analysis is that the threat comes more, seems to be coming more from internal tyranny in the counter-terrorism domain. Um, and to this day, um, you know, 18 months later, I've not come across anything that would lead to me believe I was uh, foolish to do that. So although I've lost my job uh, through making that stance, uh, I'm more convinced than ever that I was right. Uh, I've done a lot more research behind it now. Um, in a way, I was hoping I could be proved wrong because the implications of what I'm saying here, 9-11-7-7, inside job, well, people are working up in the country, um, but it's been a massive cover-up uh, and remains so both in America and in the United Kingdom by our politicians, by our police service. The institutional denial um, that I've experienced both within my own police for South Yorkshire Police. Bear in mind, I'd worked for South Yorkshire Police with an exemplary record for 17 years. Um, that institutional denial is a concern, and 
you see in more, you know, standing back and taking a look at look at all this, you see numerous miscarriages of justice. Um, the introduction of draconian terrorist laws, such as the Inquiries Act in 2005 and the Terrorism Act of 2006. You see in the erosion of civil liberties and you see numerous miscarriages of justice. Not just in the fact that within the London bombings they never had a proper inquiry, they never had post-mortems, but we had subsequent related uh, issues Three the Kingston trial were three collaborators, so-called collaborators of these so-called alleged bombers um, that I believe were actually set up as patsies. Uh, but these, these bombers that have never been proven guilty, these suicidal bombers that have never been proven guilty in a suicide, in, in a court of law, had, had three collaborators that were charged uh, and tried, but on two separate occasions found not guilty. Um, now all of that meant, as far as I was concerned, that, um, looking back, that the, the, the terror threat is uh, perpetrated by our government to heighten the fear in the public, uh, to allow the government to bring in these draconian measures, measures and to divide the, 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 the country so that people are fearful of the Muslim communities. And it's, uh, the threat from coming from Islamic, young Islamic jihadists. And the case in point here, I think, the most telling programme since is the BBC programme Generation Jihad, that shows um, young jihadists and, and a number of case studies in a terrible light um, that is simply not balanced and is blatant propaganda. And when I see Sir Norman Bettison, the chief constable, the former chief constable of West Yorkshire, um, talking about um, this going on for the next generation without being satisfactorily resolved, without the merest mention of the possibility that um, the, the real underlying problem here is that the London bombings were not committed by four terrorists. There were Muslim from Beeston and, and Aylesbury. In fact, they were committed by our intelligence services with, with com full complicity by our Prime Minister then and probably involvement with Mossad. That, you know, when we look at what Tony Blair did straight away, this has all the hallmarks. This was done in the name of Islam and Jack Straw saying this has all the hallmarks of, uh, of Al-Qaeda. Uh, I'm sorry, when you can take a good look at this as a, with your intelligence hat on, intelligence analysis hat on, this has all the hallmarks of an inside job. And you can, you can do this reasonably scientifically because you can list all the facts, not just at the time, but from the later hearing, the Lady Justice Howard inquiry. And these are facts. And the way my approach would simply be, of all these thousand and one facts that are available, do these facts when you look at them and stand back, point more towards a conceptual model that this is an inside job or that the government are telling the truth. And on so many occasions, I'm afraid, it points towards the government narrative is untruthful. Now, if the government in the narrative is untruthful in so many areas, then the government have got something very serious to hide. And when the government, when, when the normal course of justice is not followed, so we've never had a hearing to establish guilt, we didn't have post-mortems. The Lady Justice Hallett inquiry revealed information and models about the carriages and the number 30 bus, which when, upon analysis, simply um, did nothing to confirm the government narrative. On the contrary, it conflict could be contradicted it. But it wasn't evaluated properly within the Lady Justice Hallett inquiry. There was no scope within the terms of reference and within the hearing that unfolded for any critical evaluation of what was been presented. So I think we've been presented as unvarnished truth, without a critical eye, but close examination of these exhibits that were shown, the models of these carriages and the witness statements, it simply didn't add up. So there are so many anomalies that 
Um, just like 9-11, it's blatantly obvious that they were inside jobs, and it's not rocket science. So, in, in that wider context, they, uh, you know, 18 months down the line, I definitely see it, the new world order at work, and a massive cover-up by our government. And the problem is, there's only one politician, to the best of my knowledge, that's spoken out against either of these two attacks, and that was Michael Meacher. So Michael Meacher did it once upon a time, stick his head above the parapet, but it wasn't long before he's been quietened and he won't speak out about 9-11, in spite of it being so obvious. And um, why is that? Well, these people running our country, running this global elite, are immensely powerful people, and I think there's fear. There's fear to speak out, there's corruption in high places, and there's cowardice. And uh, I think in my situation, it's disappointing to be dismissed, but I'm going through an interesting employment appeal, whereby the way it's turned might allow me to produce the analysis that so far has not actually appeared in the court itself, in the employment tribunal. So, um, at the moment, my case is still alive, on, in going through to the Employment Appeal Tribunal in London, where it's been fought on the Public Interest Disclosure Act. Now, that offers me a chance um, to reveal the analysis that I have, to reveal the deficiencies in the process that I was asked to do, which was a strategic threat assessment matrix. And on both counts there, there's a, public, there's, a, there's a duty of care for me because one, I was alleging criminality on the terror threat on, and the fact that I was alleging uh, state complicity with the London bombing. Now, under the Whistleblowing Act or the Public Interest Disclosure Act, I should be entitled to do that without fear of being dismissed. And on the second area, I have been, as a principal intelligence analyst, for two years prior to 2010, I have been um, the biggest critic of the strategic threat assessment risk matrix models that were being asked to be introduced by the National Police Improvement Agency and been checked by the Her Majesty's Inspectorate from Constabulary, the HMIC. But my first degree was applied statistics, and I saw these models that we were being asked to produce as, as a gimmick and totally unreliable and invalid from a statistical viewpoint. And then more to actually um, confirm a narrative rather than to analyse what the threat was. Uh, and these were very hideously crude models that didn't make sense, uh, yet principal intelligence analysts across the length and breadth of the country were producing these for senior management to confirm the decision making that was already being made. And inevitably, what the government was coming out with and MI5 were coming out with was a very dumbed down threat level assessment, which had five categories. Critical, substantial and severe were generally, it would hover between those three over time. But you've never told when it varied and when it lowered or hired, what, what was the basis of it. But it was, there to lead the people to believe that there was a threat, invariably there was a threat likely. But as I say, with 9-11 and 7-7 not being committed by Islamic extremists, but more perpetrated by our internal intelligence services and government, what could you, who could you trust here? I felt that you know, these threat levels were deliberately there to exaggerate a fear, so it was a bogus threat that was being created in the minds of the public. The public were accepting this, and as a result of them accepting it, were clamouring for work, and this was justifying the aggressive foreign policy and justifying the implementation of draconian legislation that was coming in, and the erosion of our civil liberties at a time when we're going through a time of austerity and cutbacks. And this was now becoming so serious, I believe, that it was tantamount to becoming a police state, a fascist police state. And 
I think the way that I've been treated um, is a case of institutional denial. Uh, from the time I got dismissed in September 2010, going through the appeal process at the South Yorkshire Police Authority, which was in November 2010, going through the Employment Appeal Tribunal, which happened on a number of occasions in May 2011 and in September where there was a three-day substantive hearing um, from fair dismissal. All that I experienced and I encountered institutional denial within both the police service and the judicial system and a propensity to tell untruths in order to protect reputations. I think that's sad for me to have to relate back to an aud any audience that having worked with the police for so many years that uh, and co work colleagues that they haven't they're not brave enough to face up to the truth. And I know really that when a director of intelligence says, you know, you and I will never get them to tell the truth. And when the director of finance in dismissing me says, your views may well be correct, but it's incompatible with where, where we are today. They're saying to me in the code, we know you're probably right, but we're not prepared to do anything about it. So we've got to get rid of you. Or, you know, they may well not have wanted to get rid of me, but the, there is an issue there as to, if I was making a protected disclosure, they had a duty to investigate. And they're on record in this employment tribunal of, op of holding their hands up and saying, no, we didn't investigate Mr. Farrell's analysis. Um, so I think there's a potential that the case could be won. And if it is won, then it could be highly embarrassing um, because questions will be asked and analysis will be allowed. And although this won't be a criminal court, it will be an employment appeal hearing tribunal, it could still be um, exceptionally embarrassing for senior statesmen in the United Kingdom and senior police officers. Do you think that case will encourage other officers to come forward like you have? Or? Well, I would hope so, but there are, there are two ways of looking at it, because I think use me as an example to say, look, if you step out of line, this is what happens. We just get rid, we get... Uh, we, we have him out of the way and um, you know, they dismissed me very quickly and this was after an exemplary record with no allegation of any misconduct. They just got rid. Um, now, does that scare other people off from doing this? Well, I've become quite vocal in the truth movement. I've lost all fear, so I speak out against this. And What I have noticed is that police officers are increasingly coming up to me, shaking my hands and saying, Tony, we know you're right you're doing a grand job, what do we do about this? Um, and they tell me tales about some of the things where they, they know they should be doing something about it, but it's not been addressed properly within senior places in, in, in the police. Uh, so they're concerned, so that there, there is an increasing body of police officers who are concerned with what's going on across the board within the police service. And um, so I think the, 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 by the same token, so me making this stance and actually falling and, and getting the sack, but taking it through what is a reasonably high profile appeal employment tribunal that is still alive and kicking, I hope that that will encourage other people within the police service. I hope it will encourage other principal intelligence analysts and other intelligence analysts to um, challenge. Uh, in my own function, and it, it, it is an important function that should be objective. They're not there as spin doctors, I've already said. They're there to provide analysis that gets us primarily to the truth. That should be the purpose of analysis. Not to court favour, not to side with one thing as opposed to another. Simply to provide analysis on the facts. And when it ceases to become that, as it did in my particular case, then we haven't got intelligence analysts. We've got spin doctors and we've got the beginnings of a police state. Um, so these are non-trivial issues. 
this couldn't get much bigger than what we're talking about. 9-11, the terror threat, the London bombing that led to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and now you look at what's happening with imperialistic designs with America, backed by our own government within Libya, within Syria. And I dare say, it's frightening what's going on with Iran. And all this was foretold, all this was foretold before 9-11, by the neocons in America. We look to Zbigniew Brzezinski and his grand chessboard, we look to the project of the new American century, where they were planning a catastrophic event that would engage the American people in such a way that they would agree to and support an aggressive foreign policy agenda in the Middle East. And 9-11 was your new Pearl Harbor, where the people supported the war on terror at first and were blind to the obvious. Mm. Um, and it's worth a treat. So even 11 years on, the American people, even if they are alert to the possibility, uh, are not challenging their government in sufficiently ter stern terms to get to the bottom of the issue, and just like they were, they, they still haven't done that nearly 50 years on from the JFK assassination. Um, and there is a movement within the United Kingdom that calls for an independent inquiry for the London bombing, but it falls on deaf ears, and it doesn't seem to be getting anywhere, and you haven't got a single politician speaking out against the London bombing. And yet, when you stand back and look at the evidence and analyse it properly, it all points to an inside job. And it's inconceivable that politicians aren't aware of that possibility. But they're not prepared to look into it. They're completely turning a blind eye. And that's serious. And how we break through that, oh, how we break through that so that... Uh, the pressure turns on politicians to do something about this. When the public remains blind, by and large, it's quite a challenge. But it's an incredibly important challenge. Because we can't allow the government to perpetuate this divisive policy, which is leading to alienation. It's leading to... Uh, hatred and it's done in such a way that people from one faith are fearful of another and it's all exaggerated and we have got in England in, in the United Kingdom we've got uh, right wing groups such as the British National Party we've got the English Defence League pitted against the United Against Fascism and we're at the other end of the extreme we, we, we do see on the, on the streets ex extreme jihadists. But often, when they're shouting, we, look, we see uh, an impotent police force, police service, unwilling to arrest, almost allowing it to happen. And yet, anybody dare so much speak out, a Muslim dare so much speak out about, and, and, and the mere suggestion of 9-11, 7-7 being inside jobs, they may well treat differently. And I think in the United Kingdom now, there's a great fear of what's happening, and that I think there's three, there's, there's probably three categories of people. Those that are actually evil themselves. Those that are alert to the possibility, but are cowardly and don't say anything. Those that simply are, are too plugged in to the drug, the television and simply haven't got a clue um, because they're blissfully unaware of anything other than what the, the mainstream media tells them. And those that really do know the truth and are, are willing to put their head above the parapet and fight for it. But those at the moment in our country are in the tiny minority and where we've got state people, state persons that really matter, we've got the precious few to have the courage to be out about the corruption in high places and speak out against the obvious lie
that occurred with Dawn and Bonnie. What's your message for those people with the courage to speak up? I think let's start with the police service. Um, because I'm most familiar with that. I think that um, my own profession, analysts, should certainly um, start to create waves and under no circumstance compromise their value system. So if they're placed in a position where they're forced to or expected to say the threat comes based on government rhetoric when they know it should be otherwise, that they have the courage to make a stance in a similar way. They can't keep sacking analysts if they do that. They've got to take note. At the same token, we've got senior, well, very well paid uh, ACPO, Association of Chief Police Officers, who um, will be alert to 9-11 and 7-7. And they have a voice and they have an obligation and a duty of care to speak up when they see evil. And well, I think the police service should follow the mantra, their own mantra. I mean, for instance, in my force, when I joined the service, I was quite encouraged because the mantra that I was familiar with at the time was justice with courage. And I like that mantra. But they sacked me to show courage when I saw injustice. So they weren't walking the talk. Um, and I think that's what's necessary. In fact, I'm reminded from Edmund Burke in 1774, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. So the message, succinctly put, is to do something and speak out, and for those in senior positions to start shouting for the rooftops. And I think there is a chance that the police will become divided over this, but um, if the police if the police remain silent and complicit, then we are spiralling towards a police state. And I think there are too many good people in the police service to allow that to happen. So I'm optimistic. If the message can be put out forcefully, um, then I've got hope that the police will start to heal itself. But I think it's, it's rather likely to come from a bottom-up approach because I'm beginning to lose a little bit of faith in the, the leadership across the police service at the moment. I think uh, we have problems with Freemasonry, um, and we have problems with corruption, we have problems with the New World Order and the agenda, the Common Purpose agenda. So they are, as my Director of Intelligence eloquently put, merely the government foot soldiers. Well, they're not, they're public servants, and they have a duty to the public and the duty to honour their oath as they signed up as police officers. And that oath means putting into practice, and it's, it is a question of justice with courage, and standing for the truth, and for justice. And there can be no sacred cows. So uh, you know, the government, the intelligence services, are not exempt. So when they have committed murderous, criminal acts, Somebody somewhere in the police service at high rank needs to stick the head above the parapet and take action. And that's my hope and that's my plea. And I hope that um, enough good people in the police service start to wake up and galvanise into some effective action.